Um, for those of you who were here last time, I apologize. Uh, we met with our seniors, and they said we asked them um, what they wanted, and they said, well, we want some practical advice. So I started a series which I call 101. We did financial planning 101. Um, last Thursday, I did the stock market 101. And what I did last time was sort of the theoretical underpinnings of the market, how to look at the market. And today, what I'm going to do is tell you, I'm going to name names. I'm going to tell you what to do or what I think you should do. So um, this is, uh, and I promise to get you out of here by 7 o'clock. I promise I won't uh, drone on past 7 o'clock. So if you're sitting here thinking, how much longer can he go? Look at your watch. Think about 7 o'clock and I will be done. So uh, here's a, sort of a quick summary of what I did last time. I think markets are efficient. I think uh, markets are 98% efficient. I think there's some pockets of inefficiency, but man, are they hard to find. Um, and what do I mean by efficient markets? I mean that stocks are fairly priced. So if you buy GE, GE is, and you're paying $30, that's what it's worth. Um, and it may go up, right? I mean, you may say, oh, it's on a, but what will happen is the only reason you'll make money on GE is your luck. Right? Uh, I mean, their GE may shoot up, but uh, it wasn't your brilliance, it was luck. And especially large cap stocks. Um, I mean, there are literally thousands of people who are brilliant watching these stocks. And they're, you're buying and selling, trying to figure out what the price is. And so you're going to sit here in Greencastle, Indiana, by yourself, trying to figure out if GE is overvalued or undervalued. The odds of you doing that are virtually zero. So um, that's what I mean by um, markets are efficient. Those of you who were here last time, uh, what was the thing I kept saying? Buy low, sell high, which seems like, oh my God, this guy's got a PhD and then the only thing he can tell you is buy low, sell high. As it turns out, this is the biggest mistake that individual investors make. They, they uh, buy high and sell low because it's so, it's, it's right when the market's going down, what do you want to do? Oh my God, it's bad, I gotta get out, I gotta get out, get out, get out, get out. It's going down more and more, get out, get out. Of course, that's when you need to be buying, all right? So, and then when it's really high, people go, oh, I should be in, I should be in. Well, it's really high, and so what they're gonna do is buy high and sell low. And literally, uh, people have looked at this stuff. Uh, the average consumer loses about 2% per year by buying this. And the other thing that uh, I wish I'd looked this up, but if you looked over a 10 year period and you looked at the market and you missed the 30 best days in those 10 years, you probably lost two or 3%. Because when the market turns, it turns violently. And if you're not there, you missed it. And so, uh, I mean, I always say when it's going down, I rolled the beast down. I'm going to stay with this beast until it turns around because I don't know when and then nobody else does either. We talked about technical analysis. Um, the stock market is one of the places um, where I think that in general, well, I don't think in general, I think the best uh, place to put your money is also happens to be the lowest cost. So what are the, these are the two things that I told you you can control, cost and then the risk you take on. So those are the two things you control. Keep your eye on the ball. If you look in the first one, I said keep your eye on the ball. Everything else is beyond your control. What, what fiscal policy is, what monetary policy is, what it, unemployment is, all those things you, you cannot control. These are the only things you can control. The other thing I, 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 I'm going to predict, five years from now, people are going to say, how could I have been so stupid? Uh, bonds, if you, bonds are a terrible place to be now. Bonds have done a wonderful thing. Uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. What's going to happen to interest rates? If you pay attention at all, interest rates by historical standards, they're going to go up. <laughs> interest rates are going to go up. I, I don't know when, but they're going to go up. They're not going to be this low uh, forever. And what happens when the interest rates go up to bond prices? They go down. There's an inverse relationship. So people are going to say, oh my God, I bought AAA bonds, I didn't, and they lost 30% of their money. I thought, Jesus, I thought I was going to, I was safe, I was AAA bonds. So if you're going to buy bonds, 
keep what we call the duration, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, keep the maturity really short. I would not buy a bond now for more than two years. Actually, I wouldn't buy a bond that's even one year. Because uh, interest rates are going to go up, and they're going to go up, and they'll go up fairly dramatically, and the bond prices are going to tank. And people are going to say, I didn't know. Nobody told me. I'm telling you. I'm telling you now. Bonds are going to uh, Bonds are not where you want to put the money now. Okay, so I promised to tell you to name names, uh, do things. Uh, so here we go. Um, this is my Mike Sullivan uh, portfolio. Uh, buying individual stocks. My, my response, so th I, these are portfolios my students, they actually didn't, uh, uh, turned in, and I'm grading them. And my response to this is, you're going to buy individual stocks, and I'm going to go, come on, man! Mike, didn't you listen to anything I said? Did you not listen to anything I said last time? Um, you get a D minus, and that, you know, I'm trying to be generous, because you really deserve an F. Uh, this is not the way to make money in the stock market. Uh, buying individual stocks, forget it. It's a loser's game uh, for us. Uh, there, uh, I, last time I did this lecture, uh, on Friday, I got the uh, New York Times, and this guy was talking about it. markets. Really, uh, he said markets are really inefficient. Uh, let's just take uh, Warren Buffett for example. He beats the market, and I'm beating the market, and so it's, the markets really aren't efficient. I don't know what those academics are talking about. But then he said, okay, on average, we have to be average. If Warren Buffett and he's beating the market, if indeed he's true, on average, we have to be average. So if somebody's beating the market, guess what? Somebody's got to be losing to the market. And guess who's losing to the market? Us, right? Uh, so, I mean, he made an argument, oh, no, the markets aren't efficient. But really, really what he was saying is, and, and the last line, and I love the last line. I should have duplicated and brought it in. He said, um, he was talking about, well, you should try to beat the market. But then he said, don't try this at home, right? And I, you can't do it. If you're going to do it, Mike, come on, man. You need at least 15 stocks. There's, um, there's something called systematic risk and unsystematic risk. Systematic risk, uh, and if we, this was a real class, uh, I'd probably spend 30 minutes talking about systematic and unsystematic risk. If you buy a stock, you pick up two kinds of risk. Systematic, i.e. you're in the system, the market's up 10%, stocks tend to go up 10%, markets are down 15%, you tend to go down. That's what we call systematic risk. You're in the system, you gotta do it, sorry. There's something called unsystematic risk. So when you buy GE, you're in the system, but there's also bad things or good things that can happen to GE, which means that it moves even more or less in the market. And how do you eliminate unsystematic risk? You buy a bunch of stocks, and so you have some that are really good, some that are really bad, and you eliminate them. So you need at least 15 stocks. And so, you know, if you assume these stocks are selling for $30 a share, there's 100 shares, that's $3,000. For one stock, you need 15, so you need about $45,000 to get in the market with this. Mike's got 45 million, but so that's all right. Um, if you're going to do it, there are pockets of inefficiency. I really do believe this, but you have to buy block value stock. There are three kinds of stocks. There's um, growth stocks, mixed, and then value stocks. And and value stocks, what that means is it's either got a low PE or a low book to value, i.e., this is what nobody else wants. These are dogs. And as I told you, I'm a contrarian. When everyone's running for the exit, I'm coming in and vice versa. Um, so if you're going to do it, um, you need to buy what are called low cap stocks. Low cap stocks all means small stocks, small companies, i.e., cap is just the number of shares times the market price, and that's a capitalization. Of and big boys and big girls buy big stocks, right? I mean, and what I mean by big boys and big girls, people with millions of dollars, okay? You can't play that game because they're, they're doing all the research. So if you're going to try to buy stocks, do value stocks low cap, and I will talk about this a little more. And the other thing is don't be a trader. Um, it's really easy. It's really easy to try to chase the latest, hottest thing. If you buy a good stock, stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with it. Um, and because you, number one, it's expensive to trade stocks. You've got to 
There's a buy ask spread. There's also a broker's charge. And then you've got an uncle who wants to share everything with you. Uncle Sam, right? So there are tax indications. So if you're going to be a trader, um, it's going to be tough. So you get a D minus, Mike. Congratulations. Okay. okay, here's my next one. Um, this is a little bit better. This is a little bit better. Uh, you all know what mutual funds are. Does anybody not know what a mutual fund is? Don't be afraid to. Okay, all a mutual fund is, I'll tell you just quick, um, is it's a pooling of money by people. They buy, they hire an active money manager, and what he or she's going to do is going to pick stocks for you. Right? And they'll have criteria. They'll say, well, we're buying value stocks, big companies, small companies. We're only buying energy stocks. So, I mean, you set out a strategy, and then you hire a manager, and he or she manages your money. And actively managed uh, funds means that they are buying and selling all the time. Okay, that's all that means. Um, I've already told you I don't think you can beat the average. I don't think you can. Uh, last time, those of you who were here, we did the flip coin thing. I mean, what you do is what, I mean, you'll go to Morningstar, and all Morningstar does is look backwards or um, money magazine, they'll recommend. But the problem is, is, is somebody's doing better than the market. Why are they doing better than the market? There are two explanations. Number one, they're really good. Number two, they're really lucky. And so you've got these people that have beaten the market for 10 years. You go, oh, should I or should I not? Right? You've got 1,000 people flipping a coin. Somebody's going to flip ahead 10 rows, 10 times in a row. And the question is, are they lucky or are they good? As it turns out, there's a lot of statistical evidence. There's something called a regression to the mean. So the top ones come down to the average. The bottom ones come up. And if you're going to pick at random, it's better to pick ones that are down here because they come back up to the mean. So actually what you look at at Morningstar is the ones up there. Now some of them will stay up there because they're really good, but it's going to take you 10 or 15 years. By that time they're big and so I'm not a big fan of managed funds. Obviously I'm giving you a C plus. And you listen to anything I said? Um, if you're going to do it, you want one that has a low turnover and what I mean by turnover, and anything, anything less than 25% is a low turnover. Uh, I've seen funds that have turnovers of 200%, which means they turn the portfolio over twice during the year, which means they only hold the stock for six months. They're chasing something. They're chasing something. A, a portfolio turnover 100% is they only, on average, hold the stock for a year. Right? 50%, they hold the stock for two years. You following me? And I said 25%, which means on average they'd hold a stock for four years. You don't want somebody chasing something. They're, oh, I get it over here, and I need to be over here, and I need to be over. I've seen turnover uh, in excess of 200%. And I just go, I don't even want to talk to you. I don't, yeah, just forget it, forget it, forget it. I don't even want to talk to you. You're chasing, and uh, you're costing me money, and you're not, you're not in it for the long haul. Uh, low cost, um, and I told you last time uh, what I define as Low cost is 35 basis points. Remember what a basis point, 100 basis points is 1%. 200 basis points would be 2%. 50 basis points would be a half of 1%. So I said I'm going to pay as much as 35 basis points, i.e. 35 hundredths of 1% to manage my money. Uh, Acting managers, you're not going to be really hard pressed to find somebody that does that. Uh, no sector funds. If you go to the Wall Street Journal or if you go somewhere, the, the funds that are going to make the most money are sector funds. And what I mean by a sector fund is somebody that only invests in um, hospital stocks or energy stocks, right? Because that's one of those sectors that's going to be really hot and they're going to be there. That's what they're doing. Um, and unless you know which sectors, usually, once again, it's a regression to the mean. If you're going to buy a sector stock, buy one that's out of favor, right? I'm a contrarian. Uh, so, um, if I was also going to do this, I would diversify, right? Uh, I'd buy five or six actively managed funds because I don't know which one's good, which one's bad. Uh, I would try to diversify across brains and, okay, these guys are all brainy. 
And I'm going to buy the ones the best, but I don't know which one's the best, so I buy four or five. And once again, I wouldn't do this at all. Um, and you're going to see this a lot. Uh, guess where the inefficiencies are? You can buy a mutual fund that is a value fund, right? Which means it's out of favor, low PEs, um, low book to stock. Also, small cap funds again, which I think, if there's inefficiency, this is where they exist. Um, and the long-term record, I I look at them, but they scare me, right? I would never look at a record less than five years. Um, and once again, I, you know, once you look at the record, what, what's the two explanations? Lucky or good? Uh, and I don't know how to separate lucky from good. All right. If you want to, now, uh, you come into my office and you want to peel your grade A. I got a C plus. I got a scholarship. I got a B plus. The only way you're going to convince me to have more than a C plus is if you mention dimensional funds. Uh, they are actively managed funds. Um, I think I told you there's a guy named David Booth who went to school with me. Gave $300 million. Well, what's the name of the University of Chicago School of Business? Booth. Booth. Same guy. $300 million he gave. Um, this is, I'm telling the story so I can tell it any way I want. He um, went to the University of, well, he went to the University of Kansas first. If you go to the University of Kansas, there's the Booth Hall of Fame. So he also bought uh, a James Naismith's original handwriting uh, of the rules of basketball, paid $8 million for him, and gave him to the University of Kansas. This guy oodles of money, all right? Um, he went to the University of Chicago. There are people who won Nobel Prizes talking about the stock market. Uh, he said, why don't we do it? Why don't you, I just, you, know, you, know, you academics do is ever talk about things. Let's do it. And so he started dimensional funds. And guess what he buys? I drank the Kool-Aid. What does he buy? Say it. Value funds. Small cap. Uh, and it's almost an index fund. Uh, and once again, if this were a class, we'd spend 15, 20 minutes about how what their philosophy is. Dimensional, uh, and all he means by dimensional is, okay, there are certain dimensions to the market where I can beat the market. One of them is by small stocks. One of them is by um, uh, value stocks. The other is to stocks are trendy. So if they're going up, they tend not to buy them. If they're going down, they tend to buy them, so they think there's momentum in the market. Um, and also, I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, there's some real problems, although what I'm about to tell you uh, to do with your money, uh, there's some problems with it. So if you came into my office and said, look, damn it, uh, I'm going to buy an actively managed fund, you gave me a bloody C+, plus. come on, I'm doing dimensional, and, and, and this is in the academic community, give me a break. And I go, okay, all right. B minus. B minus, 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 minus. I get a C plus. Okay, so um, this is not a bad option, but uh, it's not a great option. There are better options. Um, <laughs> I got I, I to go back to the low cost. Uh, some of you were here last time. Um, Susan and I, my wife and I, went to New York City and went to an actively managed mutual fund. Uh, they did a conference. And um, at the end of it, at, the, at lunch he has entertainment, surprise entertainment, which I won't tell, well, it was Melissa Etheridge. Uh, and the evening entertainment was Barbara Streisand, right? And so, I mean, I'm literally sitting there and, you know, it's, he starts talking about this person. And about halfway through he's talking about memories and, the way we were, and I go, oh my God, it's going to be Barbara Streisand. So Barbara Streisand comes out, she sings 10 songs, a little over an hour, right? 10 songs, a little over an hour. How much do you think you can make if your name is Barbara Streisand and you do 10 songs in a little over an hour? Anybody want to venture a guess? Give me a number. Number between zero and infinity. Any number, just pick one. Yeah, I know you don't know. Otherwise, if you knew, I wouldn't be asking you. Pick a number. Million bucks. How much? Million. Two point three million. Two hundred thirty thousand dollars per song for one hour. 
I'm an economist. Is there such? Who paid for that? A guy named Ron Barron. Where did Ron Barron get his money? He does an actively managed fund, right? There's no such thing as free Barbara Streisand. Right? Uh, somebody had to pay for it. Now, now he didn't go and charge the investors, right? But he his, he charges about 150 basis points to manage money, right? And I told you to do 35, so this guy. He's expensive, and he can afford. He's one of the four, 400 richest guys, right? 2.3 million is <coughs> Trump change, right? It's what he took out of the cookie jar. Um, he said his wife heard Barbara Streisand when she was in high school, and he was. This was his present to his wife to bring Barbara in to do ten songs. Of course, he wrote it off on taxes, so part of it uh, was on taxes. But. All right, we're now in the B plus range. Thank God. All right. This is not a bad option. This is not a bad option. Uh, by the way, this is, I, I stole this. This is, a, uh, I should have footnoted, this is literally from the Vanguard. By the way, I just need to mention, I am not an employee of Vanguard. I never earned any money from Vanguard. Uh, I have nothing to gain by saying these things. Vanguard, is, you're going to hear it over and over and over again. It's by far, in my opinion, the best a mutual fund complex in the world. Uh, it better be, because this is where most of my money is parked. Um, so these are called Vanguard Target Retirement Funds. Um, I, you can read this. Uh, Vanguard Target Retirement offers a diversified portfolio. Great, diversified. I told you to be diversified with a single fund. So you're going to buy the fund, and it's going to diversify among funds. That adjusts its underlying asset mix over time. So. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. The fund provides broad diversification with incrementally decreasing exposure to equity and increasing exposure to bonds. This is what they call a retirement fund. So what you do is you buy the retirement funds. If you buy the 2060, it's going to be 90% equity, 10% bonds. And then as you approach retirement, they reduce the equities, they increase the bonds. And then you read down here, the fund continues to adjust approximately seven years after the date they allocate to the final thing, which is, I think, 30% equity and 70% bonds. So the number in equity is going to go down over time. The bonds are going to go up. They do this automatically. They buy four, four index funds, um, one domestic, one international bond fund, one domestic, one international, and they adjust over time. Um, if I bought one now, I do not own any Target, but this is not a bad option. You buy one, and you sit back, and you never have to think about it again. Vanguard does your work. Uh, what did I say about bonds? Okay. Don't do it. Notice on the 2020 fund, uh, what are they? At 65 equity, 35 bonds. I would actually, if, I, if you put a gun to my head and said, look, you've got to buy one, I would buy the 2060 fund. Um, I'll be retired by 2060 <laughs> in many, many ways. <laughs> but the reason I would is not because I want to retire in 2060. I don't want the bond exposure right now. So even though, so you can buy these and, 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 and not be in a retirement fund, right? I mean, it, 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 you say, look, I'm going to buy a house 10 years from now. Uh, buy the 2060 fund. I will, right? Even though you're not going to use the money retired. Uh, because it's a one-stop shop. Uh, it's a one-stop shop, and you get uh, you get diversification. Uh, it's an index fund. It's fairly low price. Uh, advance the. Uh, you know, my first point is match your target fund to your risk profile. Notice I didn't say match your match the fund to your retirement age. Uh, like I said, if I bought one now, it'd be 2060. Uh, even though. <laughs> I will be retired in 2060. Uh, how do you pay for that? In other words, how does Vanguard make money off of it? Well, um, uh, uh, keep costs low, and I, the word bonds here, I just put, uh, I'll tell you in a second, Hunter. The, the word bonds is, I just want to remind myself to tell you don't buy bonds, uh, and I wouldn't buy 2020. Uh, the way all mutual funds do it, uh, I thought I wrote down how much the cost was. You guys got the slides. The next slide, next slide's not cost, is it? Yes. Oh, it is. 
No. Um, that's a, a kind of what they do is all mutual funds, not managed, active, and, and passive. Um, what they do is they charge you, I think this one's about 25 basis points. It may not be that much. And so what they do is they, they get dividends, and what they do is they just reduce. So if they're going to give you $100 in dividends, they're going to give you $99.50, right? And they keep the 50 cents for their payment. So they never send you a bill, right? Uh, you just don't get quite all the, all the kick. Is there a little thing like where you get this grab online and you get to shrink, like the bond part of yeah. what you want? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Because that would mean they would have to do something individually for you. I mean, this one will shrink. I mean, there's a 2020 fund, there's a 2025 fund, there's a 2030, 35, 40, 45, 50. And that, that, that's going to shrink. That little piece is going to shrink, the equity part. Um, I don't think you can individually do these. Um, OK. Well, we're back to a B minus. Not so good. Um, actually, I own this fund. I still don't own this fund. I own this fund for a long, long time. I, I told you Paul Samuelson wrote this scathing editorial uh, saying that all active managers should be shot, uh, they're worthless. And in 1976, they started this uh, index fund. And uh, as the industry's first index fund for individuals. Um, so this was the first one. This is Vanguard again. So if you want to do it, it's Vanguard 500 index. Um, it's a low cost. Um, they buy, guess how many stocks they buy? <laughs> now I know if anybody's listening. How many stocks do you think they buy? 500? Uh, hence called the 500 index. Used to be called S&P 500. However, S&P said we're going to sue your butt. And so they said, OK, we'll just drop the name. Uh, so it's, it's a 500 index fund. Um, uh, many different. Now, this is important. Uh, I'll harp back on this. Um, it's 500 stocks, and it, it covers three quarters of, of the US stock market value, which means it doesn't cover a quarter. These are the largest companies, right? These are the Apples, the GMs, the Exxons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which means, let's see, where did I say you might be able to make some extra money? Small caps. Small caps. You're not getting them here. They're not in your period. Um, so I do not own any of this anymore, and that's the reason why. Um, um, <laughs> and I like their last line, it may be considered a core equity. I, I don't consider it a core equity anymore because, um, and that's why you get a B minus. You just missed a quarter of the stock. If there's market inefficiency, you missed it. Um, um, this costs 17 basis points. Actually, if you have, uh, you can get in this fund for three thousand uh, dollars. If you have ten thousand dollars, the cost goes down to five basis points. It's like, are you kidding me? You're going to charge me five hundredths of one percent to do my manage my money? I love you. Um, uh, the problem is it does not have small cap stocks, which I will told you you should do. Um, the other thing, the problem with the, this fund is they announce about two months ahead of time how they're going to have to change the composition. So let's say, and I think you'll understand this example, uh, this is the 500 smallest company. So this is the smallest company. Uh, this one is now going to be put in. So everyone announces way in ahead of time that this one's going to come out and this one's going to go in. I know Vanguard on one day, in a lot of other index funds, has got to buy this stock and they got to sell this stock. What am I going to do? I'm going to buy this stock and I'm going to drive the price up. I'm going to sell this stock, drive the price down in anticipation of them doing it. And they have no choice. On that day, they've got to buy that stock because they promised me they would match the index. And so there's a problem with the composition and the way they do it. Uh, by the way, dimensional gets around this because they say, well, we're not going to exactly minus. The other thing, the problem with an index, what did I tell you? What did I tell you about buying low and selling high? Gotta do it. Okay. I just had a stock, Apple, 
just ran up really big. Right? Apple shot through the roof. Okay, it's time to recompose the index. What do I got to do? I got to buy Apple, right? Because it's more of the index. Because this is a cap weighted index. So I've got to buy Apple at its height. Now Apple falls. It's not as much as the index. What, do I, what does the index have to do? Sell it. So they bought high and sold low. Come on, man. Don't do that. So there, there's index funds tend to buy high, sell low because of the composition, the way they do things. Uh, so you don't get an A. I'm sorry. No A. This is a B minus. Or did I give, what did I give it? I forgot already. B minus. B minus. It's not bad. And I, uh, for probably 15, 20 years, this was my core fund. There wasn't that many other options. It's okay. <laughs> it's not bad. Uh, but I don't do it anymore. Um, okay, now back to B pluses. Um, uh, by the way, uh, this is one I own. So um, we're now now from now on we're doing what Gary says. Uh, um, this is a total stock market fund. It's a B plus, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to create it so that I get it back in the A range, but right now it's a B plus. Uh, this was created in 92, uh, so I said 76, 86, 15 years later. Uh, this is Vanguard's total stock market index designed to provide investors with exposure to the entire U.S. equity market, including small, mid, and large cap. Once again, I stole this from Vanguard, right? This is their verbiage. The fund's key attributes are its low cost, Yahoo! broad diversification, Yee and the potential for tax efficiency because they don't buy and sell a lot. Right? Once you buy and sell, Uncle Sam wants his uh, cut, even if it's in a mutual fund. Uh, looking for a low cost way to gain broad exposure to the U.S. stock market who are willing to accept volatility, right? Systematic risk, right? You're in the system, sorry, that comes with stock market investing. Maybe we should consider this fund as either a core equity holding or your only domestic stock in <clears throat> so it's good. Um, once again, the cost is 17 basis points and as low as five. You got $10,000 that only charge you five, uh, which is nothing. I can't believe they can do it for that. Uh, you, uh, you need at least $3,000. They'll charge you 17 basis points, which ain't bad. 10,000 notes get you down. They're at what are called admiral shares. Now, how many were in the S&P? Well, well, I can't call it S&P 500. How many were in the 500 index? 500. How many are in this index? 3,500. I just picked up 3,000 stocks. All right? I'm picking up 3,000 stocks. So the 500 are there, and then I've got another 3,000. And I like it, right? I want small cap, mid caps. I just don't want the 500 largest companies. I want them all. Um, uh, problems. Large caps still dominate the fund. Um, uh, there's no international exposure on this. It's all domestic stocks. And OK, I got 3,500 stocks. The 10 largest holdings of stocks equal 14.5% of the fund. That means the other 3,400 have 85%, right? It's still dominated by large companies, right? I got you picked up 3,500 stocks, but boy, those ones uh, from 1,000 on, probably the next 2,500 from 1,000, I'm making this number up, 1,000 to 3,500 may not even have 14%, right? It's still dominated by large companies. Um, I guess I, I didn't explain this, but these indexes are value-weighted, so big companies have much more influence than small companies, right? So the biggest 10 companies have 14.5% of the total assets of this portfolio, right? Um, because the way the index are constructed, they're value-weighted, which means cap-weighted. So if a stock has 10% of the value of all the market, then, they, then the index has got to buy 10%. Right? And so Apple, Apple's the biggest, uh, largest cap stock now in the world. And so it's going to dominate this index. It's going to have more influence probably than the bottom of 1,000 stocks. 
because they they don't have the same cap. Um, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm now giving an A. I own this stock too. Um, let's see, what was the name of the last one? Total stock. Well, this one. Oh, this is Vanguard's. Total world. Oh, right. Sometimes it's confusing. Black total. I thought it was already had the totals. Now, now, this is the total world index. Um, this is a low cost exposure to stock markets around the globe, including the United States. Developed foreign markets and emerging markets, in addition to stock market risk, the fund is also. Now you're picking up more risk. And clearly, you got currency risk because they're going to buy stuff in uh, Europe or in England, right? And so, you know, the, the um, stock you bought in uh, England is up 10%, but uh, you got to bring it back for, out of pounds into U.S. dollars, and so there's going to be a currency fluctuation you got to worry about. So um, you're not only picking up uh, risk from buying the stock in Europe, here, but you're also um, adjusting currency. The currency, yeah, wrong button. There. Uh, the currency risk, right? So not only are you subject to the fund risk of the stock, you your currency risk. Um, this is a better option, right? Diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, so, um, um, okay, we're getting, uh, this is a little more expensive. Uh, it's going to be 35 basis points. This is starting to get, because they've got to buy stocks all over the world, right? Uh, and they've got to go to different exchanges. They're going to have more uh, uh, things to look at. And so now, what do you get with this fund? You get 9.5% uh, you of your money is going to be in emerging markets, 23% uh, percent in Europe, 14 <laughs> in the Pacific, <laughs> one-fifth of 1% one percent in the Middle East. And then bulk of this is North America, obviously Canada. I want to be the mayor of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. I can't believe you said some of the things you said. OK, here, get back on subject. Um, so uh, Canada and Mexico and being here, but probably 95% uh, of that weight is the United States. Um, let's see, uh, we've gone from 500 stocks to 3,500 stocks. Now we've got 5,178 stocks in this, OK? Um, a lot more. But once again, think about this, uh, the 10 largest, right? We got 5,000 stocks, but 10 of them, uh, the 10 largest stock, once again, Apple will be the largest, uh, makes up 7.3% of the fund. Now remember, I think inefficiency includes the small caps, and I'm really loaded with big caps or large caps. So um, you only get an A minus on this. If you're going to pick one fund, and you're going to manage your risk. You pick this fund, and you get an index bond fund. And you do it. Because now you've got not only um, exposure to the United States, you've got exposure around the world. And so, um, uh, well, the summary I'll have is, let's just say I sit down and I decide my risk tolerance is I want 80% equities and 20% bonds. So what I would do, one way to do this, is put 80% of my money into this and 20% into a very, very, very short-term bond fund right now because I'm not a big fan of bonds. And then remember what you've got to do is rebalance. So once a year, no more than once every six months. So let's say the stock market shoots up. I'm now 85, 15. What should I do? Sell. Sell stocks, buy bonds, right? Get, now, remember, sell high, why is it up? Right? I mean, it's up. So that's why I'm out of, I'm out of balance for my 80-20. So I'm going to sell these, which is hard to do because I'm making a lot of money there. Come on, man. No, sell high, buy back bonds. And then the reverse is true, right? If I end up 60-40, I should be buying stocks, right, and bringing it back because I'm buying low selling high. That's what rebalancing is all about. Um, so, uh-oh, I lost my clear. 
container somewhere. All right. Um, so this is a good option. This is a good option. You're not going to beat the market, but you can't beat the market. Um, and this is a way to get exposure to the market. Uh, you've got international stocks. You only, I mean, you're, now you only have two things to manage. That's it. And once a year, you spend 15 minutes looking at it and wait another year, look at it again. Okay. Um, ah, yes, I'm doing good. Um, okay, now, oh, guess what? <laughs> I'm not going to do uh, go through them anymore one at a time. Um, this is what Gary does. <laughs> I give myself an A. Actually, I'm, actually, I'm going to give myself an A++ plus plus here in a second. Um, here's what I buy. Uh, if you look at my portfolio, this is what I got. They're all Vanguard. They're all Vanguard. Um, there is a small cap index fund. I wonder why you buy that. Notice I don't put all my money there, but I think over long periods of time, small cap are going to do better. So part of my portfolio is um, small cap uh, value, right? Small cap value. Right? These, these are small companies, and they have low PEs, low book, book to market. Uh, they're going to do it. And they have done it historically. Not every year, but over cycles they do it. Uh, REIT. What the heck is a REIT? Real estate. Um, this is one, if you want to, you can leave out. Um, I think real estate, I, 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 want, I want to diversify, right? And so I'm going to have some REIT stocks, which are just simply investment in real estate. Once again, it's an index fund, so it's going to be cheap. Uh, I'm not going to pick what areas are hot and what areas are not. I'm just going to buy a REIT fund and sit there. Uh, we've already talked about total stock market. This is, this is, which one is this? This is the U.S., right? Okay, here's one I have not talked about, and this is called the extended market. Um, and I have mm, quite a bit of money here, because guess why? What do you think the extended market means? It's an index, right? It's extended market index. It's an index fund. I love my index funds. What do you think they extend? They value all those stocks except the top 500. So now I got rid of Apple, those huge funds, right? Those huge companies. I think, I think I'll do just average on these ones. I think small cap, mid caps, uh, where you should be. So this fund, all it does is it matches the index without the 500. And over long periods of time, they, they do better than the total market. All right? Not every year, not every day. Um, but So I've got extended markets because I, I want to get out of just having too much big companies. Um, big companies are great, but uh, that's not what's going to grow precipitously. Uh, I've already talked about total world. I want to get make sure I've got international exposure. And this is uh, where I get some international exposure. Uh, once again, this is one you could leave out. But guess what this buys? Let's see, emerging markets. This is a foreign one, which uh, invests only in emerging markets. right? It's going to be a little more risky, but over long periods of time, I think I want to be in India and China. I think uh, historically, emerging markets are going to do better than uh, developed markets. Um, and then there's another one. Uh, this is the FTSE All World, except US. So if I want some more exposure to Europe, right, this is going to be an index fund. But once again, it's going to have a lot more developed countries. So I put some money in there. And then this one, uh, actually, this is the drag I've got now, uh, is a commodity fund. Now, the reason I bought it, what you want in an index fund is when something else is up, you want yours down and vice versa, right? Which, uh, and commodity funds, commodities tend to move inversely with the stock market. Um, hence, this one isn't doing very well right now, which of course is doing exactly what I want it to, because the market's really up, so the commodities aren't. And so when the market tanks, this one will do fine, I hope. Anyway, so that's what I do. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, four, six, eight. 
or I can't count, I don't know which. Um, and what you need to do, I mean, I've got a waiting on these. You know, this is, this is uh, dealer's choice. How much do you want to put in each one? Some of you want to make, put zero in. I would put, if you're going to have it at all, it's going to have any impact, you need to have at least 5% in it. Or you can just say, you know, I don't need that. Um, and you need to rebalance. You know, the ones that are really winning and running out, you want to sell those, sell high, and you want to buy the ones that are lagging, buy low. Right? Don't forget buy low, sell high. It sounds simple, but it's not. Um, okay, so, um, I'm an overachiever. I want the A+. Plus. Uh, the A+, plus is buy admiral shares, if you can afford them. Uh, they do everything, the ones that uh, I just did, except the uh, expense ratios dropped by more than half. So buy, keep your costs low. Um, you need $3,000 to buy those funds. Uh, for $10,000, you can get what are called admiral shares. And all the admiral shares, they do exactly the same thing, except exactly, because they're exactly the same portfolio. They just charge you less. So I now got an A+. Plus, and I want an A+. Are the admiral funds like totally diversified and everything? Yeah, they're the same thing. They do exactly. Actually, Van, I, somebody told me Vanguard had a patent on this, which is hard to believe. But what they do is they have exactly the same portfolio and they just call it different things. So the admiral shares are exactly what the uh, uh, regular shares are. It's the same portfolio. They do exactly the same thing, they just charge you. With. It's hard for me to even believe you can patent it. And then finally, ETFs. They make for uh, 22 brownie points, what's ETF stand for? Somebody will know. Exchange traded funds. Exchange traded funds. Um, uh, this is what I really own, is ETFs. Um, they're exchange traded funds. There are advantage, they're even, this is the low, this is the ultimate low cost. <laughs> there are differences between this and mutual funds. Um, you. When you buy a mutual fund, you got to go to Vanguard and you, you say, Vanguard, please sell me some funds, and they'll sell you funds. If you want to sell your, buy your funds, you buy them from Vanguard. If you want to sell them, you sell them back to Vanguard. It's what's called an open-ended fund, so the number of shares is open-ended and they fluctuate. Um, an ETF is actually, they issue stock, so we're going to have to go to the stock market to get them, and, and I buy them. I could, if I buy a mutual fund, what I do is I send them the money at 5 o'clock that day. They get the money, they buy the fund. If I want to buy uh, one of these funds uh, and I'm doing an ETF, I can literally call my broker. Actually, I type to my broker, I want to buy these, and they can buy them on exchange. Because I have to buy some, I have to buy it from somebody who wants to sell it. If you don't understand what I'm saying, don't worry about it. Um, they're cheaper, but there are some advantages to doing ETFs, i.e. their lower costs, but there are some disadvantages, what you do with the dividends and things like that. And also, you have to pay broker's fees. Um, but for me, for me, my personal ETF is the correct answer. So, in summary, I'm at the end of the road. I wish I could tell you you can beat the market, but you can't. I mean, the empirical evidence, the academic evidence, my casual observation evidence is you can't beat the market. If you can't beat it, join it. Right? If you do what I suggested, I am 100% confident you'll beat 95% of the money managers. They can't beat the market. Almost all of them. And and remember, for everyone that beats the market, it's got to be somebody losing to the market, right? This is not Lake Wobegon, where everyone's above average, right? On average, people have got to be average. And somebody's beating it, somebody's got to be losing to it. Um, and if you think you're going to be one of those people who are beating it, right? Uh, remember, these men and women are brilliant, and they spend their lives looking for it, right? They, they, I mean, literally, there are a hundred of analysts I mean, you take a stock like GE, there are probably thousands of people uh, sitting 
in front of their computers trying to figure out what GE is doing and what's going on and what's good and what's bad. And if they see a bargain, they're going to be out there. And they got millions of dollars to move. And so I'm sitting here in Greencastle, Indiana, and I'm going to know something about GE that they don't. That's, uh, you must be the mayor of Toronto. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> That's kind of unbelievable. Um, you know, the other thing is diversify across that stock categories. You saw my portfolio. Um, you know, I, the reason I don't do, why don't, hey, Gary, you just said you're pretty sure that, that um, uh, small cap value stocks are where you'd be. Why don't you have all your money there? Mm, pretty sure. And also, there are periods of time when low uh, small cap value stocks are not going to perform well. And I don't know. I, if I knew when, I would buy low and sell high, right? So I'm going to diversify. And, and what am I, what's going to happen in China? What's going to happen in India? I don't know. Uh, what's going to happen to big cops? I don't know. I'm there. Whatever happens, I'm there. I'm not going to be all the way there. And when it's bad, something happens, I'm going to be there. And then something good's going to happen, I'm going to be there. But the advantage I have, right, I'm paying very little. Probably, I would guess, uh, on average, I'm paying maybe 10 basis points. Some of the stuff I'm paying three and four basis points. The international stuff, I have to pay a little bit more, uh, 35. But, uh, and, and, and the way I'm going to beat the, beat the average person is they're going to go to this one where they get Barbara Streisand. But she paid the guy 150 basis points, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to beat them, because I'm not going to have Barbara Streisand singing to me. Susan, will you sing Barbara Streisand for me? <laughs> uh, match your portfolio to your risk tolerance. I mean, this is really a personal decision. You know, I, I, you know, I, right now, I want to be 90% equities. Although, I'm a little worried about equities, because they're running up, right? See, I'm, I'm a contrarian. I mean, I'm worried now because the market's so bloody high, but I'm even more worried about bonds because they're so interest rates are so bloody low. So, um, uh, so what I can tolerate and what you can tolerate are much different. Usually, most of the people in here are young. You should be mainly in equities. When I was your age, I was 100% in equities, uh, and it's done. Mm, it's okay. Um, I'm probably still 90%. Uh, just because bonds are, what more can I say? Uh, don't forget to rebalance your portfolio. Yeah. Sorry about that. This is the button. Uh, rebalance. Uh, buy low, sell high. When something's up, you sell it. When something's down, you buy it. Very easy to say, not so easy to do, right? Because that means when the market's falling, you're buying, right? I told you, you know, in 2008, Market was down 10%. What did I do? I bought more. Uh, uh, six months later, it's down 20%. <laughs> what did I do? Buy more. 30%. Oh, bought more. Right? Oh, God, I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. I hope I'm right. Right? I mean, it takes it takes guts. I mean, you know, I sat there and thought, this may be the one exception. Right? But you buy, you buy, you buy, and then chain right? And most people were selling, selling, selling. Oh, buy, right? I mean, I made it all back, but not overnight. Not overnight, right? Um, so um, don't forget, this, this, is, this is buy low, sell high, rebalance. Uh, sell, sell the winners, buy the losers, right? If you bought good stuff, now if you bought crappy stuff, Come on, man. Don't buy more of it. But uh, if you buy good stuff, right? If it were a bargain here and it's down 10%, whoa, bigger bargain, 20%. Yeah, bigger bargain, 30%. Oh, my God. Bigger bargain, I hope. Um, I actually, um, uh, this is important. Um, I haven't said too much about it. I said some stuff about it the last time. Um, Dollar cost averaging. Um, and the example, the simple example is, you got $1,000, the stock is selling for $10. Uh, 
Uh, the next month, you got $1,000, you buy the stock at $5. What's the average cost of the stock? And I love things like this because students will go, hey, $750. And I go, wrong. <laughs> it's $667 because you bought more stock, right, at $5. So dollar cost averaging, you can actually bring. Um, I required students to uh, write a paper. And uh, what I said was, uh, assume your grandmother gave you $10 million. And she said, it's your money. All you got to do is give me a plan where you're going to use this money or invest this money wisely. So if you write, you know, and this is a paper they're turning in, I'm going to grade. And if you say, I'm going to buy a condo in Cayman, um, uh, number one, you don't get the money, and number two, you get a D minus. Uh, just leave me alone on the paper, or I'm having the biggest party my grandmother has ever seen. Uh, you know, I'm going to have people jumping out of cakes and I'm not. So, but um, obviously, you know, as I tell my students, don't don't write down the right answer. Write down what Gary thinks. So they dutifully try to guess what I was thinking. Uh, the one thing, if your grandmother gave you ten million dollars, should you go out and buy my A plus or A plus plus portfolio? And the answer is, yeah, but do it over the next five years, 40 years, right? Don't what I call a plunger, right? You got $5 million. Oh, my God, I'm buying the market today. Mm, maybe you just bought at the high point. Oh, I'm sorry, Grammy. Right? What you want to do is every month on the 15th, regardless of where the market is, you know, put in 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%. So over the next 20 months, right? Uh, you buy, you buy, you buy. And what you're getting is a dollar cost average. Don't be a plunger. Uh, if you have the luck that I have, I will buy exactly the wrong time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy every month, and sometimes I'm going to buy high, sometimes I'm going to buy low, and on average, I will get the dollar cost averaging that I want. Right? On average, I'm going to be better than average with dollar cost averaging. So don't be a plunger. I, I, I see people get huge amounts of money and they come and say, what should I do? And I say, well, you buy this, buy this. And they go, I bought it all. And I go, ooh, not so much, man, not so much. Uh, so uh, dollar cost averaging is important. The nice thing about 403Bs and 401Ks, they do it for you, right? Because uh, when you get a job and you're in a plan, you'll tell them to put so much money aside every month or every week, depending on how you're playing. And I think if I hit the clicker again, those blank. So um, uh, I will. Uh, I told you I'd get you out of here by seven. Um, I'm now officially done. Uh, will you hand these out? Um, but I'll take questions for the next two minutes, uh, and then I will dismiss you. Yes. What are your thoughts on shorting stock as a way to diversify your portfolio? Okay. Um, there are two ways. Um, I'm going to tell you what I love talking about short sales. I've never shorted anything in my life. Well, that's not quite true. I have. Not really. Uh, you can be long stocks, which means I want to buy low, sell high. If I short a stock, remember the rule, buy low, sell high. When you short a stock, what do you do? You buy low, sell high. Except you sell first, you wait, and then you buy low. Right? Buy low, sell high. So what I did first is sell, and then I bought. Buy low, sell high. Now how can I sell something I don't know? I'm going to short GE. Sell, and then buy. How can I do it? The American way. How do I do it? Margins. I borrow it. I borrow it from Tom Musser. He doesn't know it because he's got a margin account, and I sell it for him. I guarantee I'll buy it back for him. Right? There's margin. They make sure. And so Tom's got the stock long, I've got it short, I've sold it, I wait, I buy it back, right, and I give it back to him. He doesn't know it, but uh, I made some money. That's why you short stock. Okay, what's the most I can lose if I buy GE? What's the most I can uh, Forget margin accounts. I don't even know what margin accounts are, so forget it. What's the most I get, most I can lose? What's the most, I bought the GE at $30. What's the most I can lose? 100%. <laughs> What's the most I can win? Infinity. Okay, now, good news is I can only lose 100%. If I short a stock, how much can I lose? 
infinity. Right? I, bought, I took Tom's stock at $30. I promised to pay. It shoots up to infinity. I now have to buy it at infinity and put it back into his portfolio. So the most I can lose infinity, and the most I can win is the $30, right? It can go to zero, and I, here, Tom, you have your worthless stock back. That scares me. I don't like losing infinity. Right, I want to make infinity. One more question, and I'll let you go if you want to come up and talk to me. How much do you pay a stockbroker, say, I was just talking to a young person who said, I want to just buy Tesla. How do I go about doing it? And I said, I'll ask Gary tomorrow night. Uh, you know how much it's going to cost me if I buy Tesla? Is it for the broker? Okay, but if you don't have a broker? Uh, well, you got to you, you go to a broker. Okay. And if you got a Vanguard account, I think I get 30 trades here. How much stock do I own? None. So I can, that'd be one of my 30 trades. Uh, go to, uh, what's the one where the, guy, the little baby goes? Uh, E-Trade. <laughs> e go to E-Trade. I love those commercials. Nobody knows. She takes away the iPad and the kid pulls out the iPhone. Yeah. I love those commercials. E-Trade. Uh, you can do that online. Yeah, right. It's a broker and they'll charge it next to that. I would not buy Tesla, by the way, but that's another issue. Okay, uh, you got other questions? Uh, hand Rebecca the, um, that little slip of paper. Uh, you have now passed Econ 101, except for Mike Sullivan.